Let's talk about these memes that I often see floating around on social media. As we can see, it's usually some pictures from the 1950s saying something along the lines of, during this period, a family could own a house, a car, and send multiple kids to college on one single income. And usually the accounts that share memes like this say something like, what happened? Or the American middle class is failing and what is causing it? Let's begin by talking about some income facts. It's worth noting that this notion of the single income family might be a little bit exaggerated. While a lower percentage of women were in the workforce during this period, it's not like it was some minuscule amount. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, about one in three women participated in the labor force during this period. 44% of women aged 16 to 24 were working during this period, along with 39% of women aged 35 to 44. And if we compare the median family income during this period, to the median personal income of men, there's about a 30% difference, which maybe says that women working during this period was not as uncommon as many may lead you to believe. Either way, memes like this focus on single income. So let's use the median personal income of men during this period, which according to the US Census was around $3,200 a year. Could $3,200 a year or or roughly $266 to $267 a month, afford a house, a car, and sending multiple kids to college during the 1950s. Let's start by talking about automobiles. According to a few sources that I found on this topic, the average price of an automobile during this period was around $2,200 to $4,000. This article from Reader's Digest documents a variety of different automobiles during the 1950s, whose prices ranged between $1,500 and $3,000, with most of them being priced around $2,000, so I'm going to use $2,000 as a benchmark. $2,000 would make the price-to-income ratio around 62.5%, whereas 62.5% of the median personal income today would be around $23,000, which in 2023 could afford a brand new Toyota Corolla. As for financing, according to this article on Lend.edu, General Motors started Started offering financing options as early as 1919, asking for 35% down with the rest being paid off over the next 12 months, although it's hard to tell if this was the same policy during the 1950s. Today, many dealerships offer loans that span up to six years, which on one hand would help lower your monthly payment, thereby making the automobile a little more affordable, especially if you're in a pinch. On the other hand, it would mean that you're paying more for the automobile in the long run. I also found this 2013 article from the American Enterprise Institute, which shows the variety of ways in which owning an automobile is better than ever before. And according to the Federal Reserve for Economic Data, auto loan interest rates have increased a little bit over the last few years, but they're still far below their peak during the 1980s. Either way, unless some Someone can find me better data on how auto financing worked during the 1950s, I'm going to guess that the cost of financing a brand new $2,000 car during the 1950s could have cost families up to $100 a month, meaning that a family that's surviving on the median personal income of men would have about $166 a month after their car payment. And obviously, we're not considering the many ways in which automobile have improved in quality over the last 70 years. Automobiles today last much longer than they did during the 1950s. Cars are much safer today and get much more fuel mileage than they did during the 1950s. And many luxuries and aspects of driving that we take for granted today either did not exist or were much more primitive during this period when compared to today. Details like this are unappreciated by me 
memes like this that imply that life was better for the average American 70 years ago. Now let's talk about housing costs during the 1950s. This article from CNBC reports that the median house value in 1950 was around $7,300, which increased to $12,000 by 1960. And judging by some real estate advertisements that I found from this period, prices ranged between $8,000 and $15,000, with advertised mortgage payments ranging between $51 and $87 a month. And I could not help but notice that some of these real estate advertisements were for homes in Levittown, which is interesting because in the book, The Color of Law, Richard Rothstein reports that 750 square foot homes, damn, 750 whole square feet, what a palace. 750 square foot homes sold for $8,000 in Levittown. However, these particular homes were not available to non-white buyers. Thanks in large part to economic policies passed by the Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration during the beloved New Deal. Oh, you absolutely suck! And as with automobiles, it might be worth noting that the quality of houses are much better today than they were during the 1950s. Matthew Iglesias wrote an article for his Substack responding to memes like this, where he mentions that homes in 1960 were 25% smaller than they are today. Also, a higher percentage of homes during this period did not feature a lot of luxuries that are taken for granted today. Notably, central air conditioning and appliances like washing machines and dishwashers, and I guess even warm running water was not as ubiquitous as it is today. Nevertheless, if we were to take the lowest mortgage payment I could find, which would be $51 a month, a family that's surviving on the median personal income would have about $115 a month after their car payment and mortgage payment, and they would have $79 left left over for the month if they opted for the $87 mortgage payment. And this is before we consider other routine costs for owning a home, notably utilities and maintenance and taxes and insurance. And now let's talk about the cost of sending multiple kids to college. If you want a more in-depth video on this topic, I did a video a few years ago talking about the history of tuition prices for public universities. In 1953, Three, tuition prices at a public university like the University of North Carolina was $150. And this does not account for other major costs like room and board, which for a public university like UMass in 1955 was $700. And it would cost roughly $58 a month to just send one kid to UMass in 1955. Meaning that if a family surviving on the median personal income took the lowest advertised mortgage rates, leaving them with around $115 a month, sending two kids to UMass in 1955 would leave them with zero. And this is before we factor in other costs like food and utilities and maintenance for the automobile and the house and vacations and holidays and clothing and toys and other things that families would like to spend their money on to survive and enjoy life. So from what I can tell, memes like this are both stretching the truth and leaving out a ton of context. But for the fun of it, let's compare the prices and quality of products during the 1950s to their counterparts today. Just look at this advertisement for a brand new 16 inch black and white television. It looks like a television like this would cost around 10% of the median personal income. A flat screen television twice that size would cost around 2% of the median personal income today. Keep in mind this was long before the days of cable television and internet streaming and even VCRs. So your viewing options were much more limited during the 1950s. And I'm pretty sure most broadcast stations did not even air programming after midnight. And how about family vacations? When researching this topic, I found no shortage of news articles talking 
talking about how flying has become increasingly cheaper over the last 70 years. This article on Gizmodo reports that a one-way flight from Los Angeles to Kansas City would run you about $68 in the 1950s. And today, that same flight is priced lower even before you factor in inflation and percentage of income. And it looks like the same is true with other flights during this period. And where would you even take your family to during the 1950s? Definitely not the wide variety of family theme parks that we enjoy today in America. Disneyland did not even exist until 1955. As for food, as I mentioned in a recent video, American families are spending less of their income on food today than ever before. I also found this article from NPR echoing this same sentiment. Families during the 1950s did not even have a microwave in their house. And how about all of those low-cost, convenient dining options that Americans enjoy today? Ray Kroc did not even meet the McDonald's brothers until 1954. And even the oldest national pizza chains that Americans enjoy today were not founded until the late 1950s or early 1960s. And maybe I'm assuming a little too much about memes like this, but despite the economic problems that Americans struggle with today, does anyone honestly think that life was better during the 1950s? But there are some kernels of truth with these memes, so let's give them their due when they ask questions like, what happened or what caused this? Well, we know that wages and earnings are certainly not the problem, but the cost of owning a house and going to college, yes, those have become increasing problems for Americans. Housing costs in America are so high because of the variety of ways in which politicians restrict the development of new housing through insane policies like zoning laws and environmental review mandates and prevailing wage mandates and other restrictions on labor and import taxes on construction materials and rent control mandates and restrictions on building height. This is a topic that I've addressed in depth in other videos and it's something that economist Thomas Sowell talks about in his book, Economic Facts and Fallacies. Also, according to this recent article from Bloomberg, big cities like Minneapolis are enjoying a more competitive buyer's market thanks in large part to the city lifting zoning restrictions a few years ago. The Bloomberg article goes on to note that despite such progress, rent control mandates have stifled development. We can also see this with the fact that states with more restrictive development policies like California and Washington and New York and Oregon have some of the highest housing prices in the country. Whereas in states like Ohio, Georgia, Texas, and Nevada, housing is much more affordable because these states have had fewer restrictions on development. And if you're still a little confused over these trends, maybe look into something called the law of supply and demand. And college costs are so high because of the federal government's attempts to make college more accessible by securing student loans, which began in the mid-1960s with the Higher Education Act. That's just not Smart. So, in conclusion, while memes like this exaggerate the economic conditions of the 1950s, there are kernels of truth when thinking about housing costs and college costs. But to answer their questions like what caused this and what happened, from what I can tell, government intervention happened, and the solution is to unshackle the free market. <laughs> 